Since Disney's acquisition of Star Wars and the release of their own trilogy and spin-offs, you've probably heard the claim that Disney had made Star Wars woke, or made it too political. Rogue One especially, Disney's first cracker spin-off, were the subject of online controversy for explicitly political reasons, with certain groups apparently boycotting the movie based on its supposed anti-Trump message. Some people don't want any politics near their Star Wars, which is fine and understandable on its own, though the politics of the real world have been an integral part of Star Wars since its very inception, as a direct result of the man who made Star Wars himself, George Lucas. So why is it only now that people seem to have an issue with it? Did Star Wars really only just become political, or has it been that way all along? As long as there's a human mind behind it, art and film is impossible to be an entirely objective medium. The beliefs and points of view of the creator will always be reflected in some way in what they create, even in just who they tell us to root for and who they say are the villains. So the man who would ultimately give us Star Wars was born in Modesto, California in 1944, to Dorothy and George Lucas Sr. George Sr. sold office supplies and owned a walnut farm, and the future filmmaker was raised as part of a devout Methodist family. His father was successful enough in his business to provide his family with a comfortable life, and by extension provide the young George with early exposure to the kind of toys and comic books that would later influence his storytelling. Lucas has since attested that the way my father brought me up gave me a lot of the common sense I used to get me through the business world. Lucas was an avid car enthusiast growing up, with one-time ambitions of becoming a race car driver. The spaceship, I got into spaceships out of cars. Yeah. I love cars, I love going fast. Going fast. So, I like spaceships. And who would spend most of his high school years hanging out in garages and doing underground racing. However, after spending three months in hospital after nearly dying in a car accident shortly before graduating high school, Lucas ended up enrolled at Modesto Junior College to study social sciences and anthropology. Uh, I come out of anthropology. Yeah. So my focus is social systems. As his parents had refused to pay for art school. From there, he became more interested in film and photography, and eventually met cinematographer Haskell Wexler. Wexler helped him enroll at the University of Southern California Film School, where he would produce the short film that would ultimately become THX 1138. According to a conversation with The Guardian's Jeffrey McNabb in 2004, while at USC, Lucas aimed to become a documentary filmmaker and make avant-garde films on the side. Even Lucas's very first film, a one-minute short called Look at Life, is an illuminating piece in this regard. Speaking about this period, Lucas said, I was angry at the time, getting involved in all the causes. The draft was hanging over all of us and we were bearded Frico pre-hippies. He was in fact at one point drafted for Vietnam, a war he vehemently opposed, and apparently even contemplated fleeing to Canada to avoid it. But instead, he was granted medical release after discovering he was diabetic. After USC, Lucas worked as a cameraman and then as an editor, the former of which saw him film for the infamous Rolling Stones set at the Altamont Free Concert in 1969, where 18-year-old Meredith Hunter was stabbed to death. Eventually, he became acquainted with Francis Ford Coppola whilst interning at Warner Brothers for six months in 1967. Together, Coppola and Lucas co-founded American Zoetrope in 1969, a San Francisco-based studio that was supposed to be a liberating environment for filmmakers, outside what they perceived to be a controlling studio system in Hollywood. And from there, Lucas made the feature-length version of THX 1138 to be released in 1971. The film was not a success, however and Warner Brothers were apparently so bewildered by it that they withdrew their financing from American Zoetrope. In order to recoup the money lost by THX, Coppola took on The Godfather for Paramount, which obviously went on to be a very different story. Lucas himself formed Lucasfilm, and released American Graffiti, which Coppola had challenged him to make as appealing as possible to a mainstream audience. As such, American Graffiti is a coming-of-age comedy, based on Lucas's own adolescence in Modesto, and a predecessor to films like Days to Confuse. American Graffiti was released to major success, and then it was ultimately on to Star Wars in 1977 for George Lucas. He told The Guardian about choosing to make the more commercial American Graffiti in Star Wars, I thought I would try at least once before my career ended to make a traditional studio film with sets and shooting on soundstage, and that's what has led me to where I am now. So since THX 1138 and American Graffiti were Lucas's two most notable works prior to Star Wars, what does looking at them tell us about his point of view? and how that could influence something like Star Wars. THX owes a particular debt to George Orwell's 1984, one of the most talked about works when it comes to themes of totalitarianism, mass surveillance and the manipulation of facts in politics. Like Orwell's iconic dystopia, 
THX1138 sees a sympathetic protagonist pitted against an all-powerful, authoritarian surveillance state that preaches consumerism and conformity whilst criminalising diversity and free thinking. The visual language of the oppressors in THX bear an obvious resemblance to that of the Empire in Star Wars. The world is pale, cold and sterile, its enforcers are faceless automatons seemingly without humanity. If we never see a stormtrooper out of armour in the original trilogy, the police of THX are functionally no different to a stormtrooper. It's certainly the kind of piece a liberal young filmmaker growing up and going to college in California in the 60s would come up with, depicting a colourless and soulless society that was a far cry from the culture, or rather, the counterculture, that he would have been otherwise surrounded by living in San Francisco. Throughout the 60s, the city was a nexus of hippie culture, those who had rejected the more traditional values of the previous World War II era generation. Lucas even said about applying to USC, My father thought I was going to turn into a beatnik. I've always had a basic dislike of authority figures, a fear and resentment of grown-ups. Dave Filoni, the creative talent behind The Clone Wars, Rebels and The Mandalorian, and heir apparent to George Lucas himself, also points to THX as a precursor to the Empire. You have to look at the societies portraying in THX as the Empire. I saw a correlation there, from the shot compositions, the musical cues, it's my goal as we move forward to always appreciate the DNA that is George Lucas that was in everything he made, because it's so important to Star Wars. And arguably, American Graffiti exists due to the response THX received. It's a much more commercial film that doesn't wear its opinions on its sleeve quite so obviously, but the film still tells us a lot about the man behind the camera. As Lucas has described the characters of Kurt, Milner and Terry, representing himself at different stages of his life. The themes of rebellion that permeate all of Lucas' works are still there in these characters, even if the kids of American Graffiti are much more everyday rebellious, concerned more with drag racing and underage drinking, rather than toppling an authoritarian empire. Considering American Graffiti actually made money, grossing $140 million, you can start to see how Star Wars sits in between the two films, almost going as far to represent the push and pull between the George Lucas who had inherited his father's commercial and business instinct and the young filmmaker living in San Francisco who wanted to push an experiment with film. THX 1138 is almost what Star Wars looks like without American Graffiti. The latter film taught Lucas how to make a movie for the mainstream and gave him the footing he needed to make his space fantasy opera. As a result, Star Wars focuses more on the characters, the fairy tale and adventure aspect, but the background world clearly resembles a toned down THX retaining those same anti-authoritarian themes. As said by Filoni, if you're solely watching Star Wars to understand Star Wars, you're limiting yourself. You understand that the way the kids are responding to their home and authority in American Graffiti is relevant to the way the old films are, like Luke and Han and Leia. Ultimately, as much as it primarily is a story of good and evil, a fairy tale about the farm boy rescuing the princess, Star Wars is also George Lucas' statement on Vietnam. In an interview with the Chicago Tribune in 2005, Lucas delivered one of his most defining statements on this topic stating that Star Wars always was really about the Vietnam War, and that was the period where Nixon was trying to run for a second term, which got me thinking historically about how do democracies get turned into dictatorships, because the democracies aren't overthrown, they're given away. This is especially important in the context of the prequels, but we'll come back around to that. During the period just before making Star Wars, Lucas had in fact spent four years working on developing Apocalypse Now, alongside John Milius, who had been encouraged to write the script in the first place by Lucas in 1967. Lucas left the film due to his other projects, most chiefly Star Wars itself, and Coppola took over. Lucas had intended to shoot the film cinema verite style, using real soldiers and with at least some of the film shot on location in South Vietnam. Lucas himself would go on to admit that a lot of my interest in Apocalypse Now carried over into Star Wars, and that influence is felt throughout the trilogy, featuring a group of rebels at a technological disadvantage forced to engage in an asymmetric warfare against an overwhelming military might. This is particularly obvious in Return of the Jedi, with Lucas stating that the defending Vietnamese forces were even an inspiration behind the concept of the Ewoks, specifically in their ability to overcome a superior force through creativity and superior knowledge of the land. Even the ending of American Graffiti shows us a glimpse of Lucas's thoughts on the war, and its influence on his commercial work, with the reveal that one of the film's main characters was reported missing in action in Vietnam, and another had since relocated to Canada, which, based on Lucas's own history, implies could be an effort to dodge the draft. This depiction of America as envisioned by Lucas is pretty damning when you consider the ways in which the Empire is visually reminiscent of the Nazis. Lucas was hugely interested in World War II as a young child, 
and that influence can be seen all over Star Wars, especially in its cinematography and aerial space combat. So it's no surprise that for his authoritarian, militaristic villains, Lucas went for the visual aesthetic of the Nazis, even going as far as using the term Stormtrooper. Star Wars' political side was lost in its release for multiple reasons, including that it was supposedly a statement on Richard Nixon, but Jimmy Carter was president by the time that Star Wars was first released. But it was also designed to appeal to a mainstream audience, so less like THX 1138 and more like American Graffiti. And so, even if Lucas saw the Empire as a commentary on America's global presence around the time of the Vietnam War, they were presented as visually reminiscent of the Nazis instead, a clear villain for the Western world. And so that's as far as most analysis would go. Part of America's overwhelmingly positive reaction to Star Wars can be seen as actually due to the Vietnam War. America was in a dark place after the war, as Lucas himself has since said that you can't have something as powerful as the 60s and not have a consequence. He described the war as having been build as a completely harmless war over there. No bomb was ever going to fall on United States soil, but a huge psychological bomb landed on United States soil, and it changed it forever. The war was so unpopular with the American people that it had led to the end of the military draft in 1973, and a distrust in politicians that was only further compounded by Watergate. In our country, Watergate tore us apart. And then we had the Vietnam War on top of that, which was dividing the nation like nothing else had. It was a terrible decade of great storm and violence in our history. And then along came Star Wars, a fun swashbuckling adventure of heroes against villains, right versus wrong, the perfect antidote for a reeling and cynical country. If you aren't looking for it, the film has no outright stated connections to any part of the real world, allowing for pure escapism. And eventually, Star Wars became such a part of the mainstream that it took on a life of its own, beyond what Lucas could possibly have intended or anticipated. What he intended as a critique of those in power in America became a symbol of rebooted pride. One notable moment was Ronald Reagan's Evil Empire speech in 1983, whilst referring to the USSR. To ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire. Speechwriter Anthony R. Dolan refuted the idea that the term had come from Star Wars, but the connection still stuck with people, likely not helped by Reagan being a former actor himself. Reagan's strategic defense initiative was commonly dubbed Star Wars, further cementing the connection between Lucas's space opera, American patriotism, and the modern conservative movement that Reagan represented. It's especially interesting because Lucas has made no secret about the depiction of politicians within Star Wars itself. During the making of Return of the Jedi, he responded to the question of whether the Emperor had once been a Jedi. No, he was a politician. Richard M. Nixon was his name. He subverted the Senate and he finally took over and became an Imperial guy and he was really evil. But he pretended to be a really nice guy. By the time of the prequels, Lucas was no less subtle about his intentions with these films. It's interesting that the prequels have often been derided for being too political with their plot. But that conversation rarely seems to include what they are actually trying to say. More that the politics were just boring. With the context of his previous films, the themes on display in the prequels are hardly subtle. If the Empire was meant to be America in Vietnam, then the prequels are the story of how that comes about, and how tyranny can rise within democracy. The prequels are written almost as a warning about how easy it is to lose democracy. As said by Lucas, the political situation of the Empire and the Republic, that's a scenario that's been played out thousands of times over the years, and that never seems to change much. The anti-capitalism of THX 1138 returned in the Trade Federation, who literally invade Naboo to make money whilst trying to keep everything legal. Social and economic inequality is key to Anakin's fall. He starts his journey as a literal slave to a business, and even after leaving Tatooine, the disenfranchised Anakin never lets go of the anger brought on by his upbringing. The Republic fails to do its job as governing body, leaving Naboo to fend for itself, and then the Republic is later manipulated by the fear of an exterior enemy to transition into a military state under a fascist dictator. After his fall to the dark side in Revenge of the Sith, Anakin Skywalker even echoes the words of George Bush in 2002 when describing his war on terror. You're either with us or you're with the enemy. That's, that's clear. I will continue to make that clear. If you're not with me, then you're my enemy. Ian McJarmid, the actor behind Palpatine, even commented on the line to the Chicago Tribune in 2005. I know that's a line that George Bush said, but many other people who have run countries have said it before him. That really is a great Sith line. One of the most important lines in the prequels in this regard belongs to Padme in The Revenge of the Sith, when Palpatine appoints himself Emperor. So this is how liberty dies. With thunderous applause. The message as told by Lucas is clear. 
about wanting to tell a story about how democracies give themselves over to tyrants. You know, here's an interesting thing about democracy is if you don't treat it well, if you don't do your job, especially if you're a representative in the Senate or the Parliament or whatever, um, you know, the whole thing can go awry because if you're always bickering and not agreeing on things and doing the people's work who elected you, a tyrant will come in and take over and do it for you because the people want to get the job done. He even made the direct comparison in 2009. Anakin Skywalker is a promising young man who is turned to the dark side by an older politician and becomes Darth Vader. George Bush is Darth Vader, Cheney is the Emperor. Palpatine is Lucas' warning against politicians like Richard Nixon or Dick Cheney, which is made even more striking when you look at how Palpatine's rise directly parallels that of Adolf Hitler. Both held the office of Chancellor before transitioning into full dictatorship and Palpatine's orchestration of attacks against the Republic mirrors the 1933 Reichstag fire, a supposed false flag operation to gain support for the Nazi party as it allowed the passing of the Enabling Act, which gave Hitler the power to enact laws without the legislative bodies of the Reichstag or the Reichsrat. It is with great reluctance that I have agreed to this calling. The power you give me, I will lay down when this crisis has abated. Order 66 echoes the Night of the Long Knives in 1934, when the SS wiped out the leadership of the SA and other political enemies, and left Hitler established as a leader of the German military. This even links back around to A New Hope, when Palpatine has dissolved the Senate just as Hitler had disbanded the Reichsrat. The old Senate will no longer be of any concern to us. I have just received word that the Emperor has dissolved the Council permanently. Neither Palpatine nor Hitler simply took control. It was handed to them via manipulation and fear, and it's something Lucas seems to fear happening again in the Western world. And he's not exactly wrong, as there's quite an easy parallel line to follow over the last 10 years in American politics, of the rise of a certain reality TV star-headed administration. And it happened with thunderous applause. According to Lucas, I'm a very ardent patriot, but I'm also a very ardent believer in democracy, not capitalist democracy. And I do not believe that the rich should be able to buy the government. And so we come on to the Disney era, following George Lucas stepping away from the franchise, and more notably onto the backlash to certain aspects of the new films that I believe ultimately hinges on the perception of a political agenda, rather than an actual agenda itself. An example of this backlash would be the course to boycott Episode 7 on Twitter, due to John Boyega daring to be a black stormtrooper, claiming it was anti-white propaganda, and the films promoting white genocide. Men's rights activists also boycotted the film based on perceiving Rey as a Mary Sue, and both Daisy Ridley and Kelly Marie Tran found themselves run off of social media due to online harassment and abuse, often sexist and, in the latter's case, often racist. Where audiences were once united and watching rebels stand up to the Empire, suddenly there was a controversy where there wasn't one before. According to Ashley Hink, an assistant professor for the communication department at Xavier University, I would say yes, there are lots of factions in Star Wars fandom, and there are a lot of factions in our politics right now, and that can make it hard to find common ground that can make it hard to create, to do kind of collective action as a group, as a community. It's not as if the Star Wars fandom has never courted toxicity before, as there's the inexcusable way Armored Best and Jake Lloyd were treated after The Phantom Menace. A ten-year-old was bullied to the point of quitting acting, and Best was even driven to contemplate suicide at one point, after, in his words, being called every racial stereotype you can imagine. There was this criticism of being this Jamaican broken dialect, which was offensive because I'm of West Indian descent, I'm not Jamaican. It was debilitating, I didn't know how to respond. The most notable difference back in 1999 is that the social platforms didn't exist for enough people to notice the aggression, no Twitter or YouTube or Facebook. And inevitably, the rise of those platforms led to these opinions being shared over a much wider and visible platform. It's impossible, therefore, to ignore the startlingly different cultural climate that frames Disney in the sequels now, as a result of social media being what it is, and the rise of propaganda disguised as news that's frankly done a lot to normalise racism and prejudice in media. The original trilogy was released on the heels of a gruelling American defeat, and the prequels were released when the country felt threatened like it never had before, so Star Wars worked as a tonic, but come the sequels, the Western world had been internally divided ideologically, without an exterior group to see as the bad guys. It was perhaps harder to admit that the Empire and the First Order were representing something closer to home especially based on the controversy surrounding Rogue One. In reaction to the outcome of the 2016 presidential election, Rogue One writer Chris Weitz tweeted, Please note that the Empire is a white supremacist, human organisation. Fellow writer on the film Gary Witter added, Opposed by a multicultural group led by brave women. 
It wasn't long before hashtag dump Star Wars started on Twitter in response, with calls from certain groups to boycott the movie, as it was a perceived attack on white people and twice impeached former President Donald Trump. In response to the backlash, Disney CEO Bob Iger claimed to The Hollywood Reporter in 2016 that frankly this is a film that the world should enjoy, it's not a film that is in any way a political film, there are no political statements in it at all. It might be the right thing to say in terms of wanting the film to reach as broad an audience as possible, but is it actually arguably true? No film is truly devoid of politics, and those of George Lucas, a historically political filmmaker, are baked into the very premise of Rogue One. A lot of these controversies are arguably designed to recruit malleable fans into far-right movements, by framing them in such a way that these fans feel targeted or threatened by the films in question in some way. Like with the Rogue One tweets being framed by alt-right sources to be less Star Wars is anti-fascist to Star Wars is anti-you. For example, Daily Wire founder Ben Shapiro criticised the Canto Bite subplot in The Last Jedi for being social justice warrior crap about income inequality and animal rights. This is not criticism designed for discussion of the film itself, but instead a very deliberate talking point on his part, intended to make it controversial. George Hawley, author of Making Sense of the Alt-Right, and an assistant professor of political science at the University of Alabama, explain this tactic. Going on the offensive against a well-known movie or artist is a way to generate angry articles from the mainstream media, and for small movements that thrive on negative coverage, getting mentioned at all counts as a win. Twice impeached former President Trump literally made his political career on this kind of rhetoric, and so looking at it this way, it's no wonder something as big as Star Wars became caught up in all of it somehow. During the Rogue One controversy, alt-right social media personality and activist Mike Chernovich pointed towards another of Chris White's tweets as evidence of attacking the now former president, a tweet that simply said, more female heroes. The implication is somehow that pro-woman is anti-Trump, by painting the non-progressive side as the victims. The KKK used similar strategies all the way back in the 1920s, according to Tim Rice, a lecturer at St Andrews University and the author of White Robes, Silver Screens, movies and the making of the Ku Klux Klan. According to Rice, there are clear points of comparison with how the Klan protested against film in the 1920s. These protests, then and now, seek to position the group as an underdog and the threatened minority. And part of the problem on top of this is public figures identifying with the villains. Shortly after the 2016 presidential election, Steve Bannon told The Hollywood Reporter that Darkness is good, Dick Cheney, Darth Vader, Satan, that's power. The overall rhetoric here going on is insidious. If you're anti-Empire, does that make you anti-right? Does supporting the rebels in Star Wars mean going against your own political beliefs? And people like Bannon are hoping that those questions have the desired effect, to make people feel betrayed by the stories they enjoy. For so long, Star Wars has been this cultural behemoth, but it's never been as expansive as something like Marvel or Star Trek. There was always one timeline, one canon, with only a few movies in it, and that was basically it. And so to a degree, what we're seeing may be the consequence of that. There's a ton of pressure on the main Star Wars movies to somehow appease three separate generations of fans that have since been separated through distinct cultural and societal shifts. J.J. Abrams, director of The Force Awakens and Rise of Skywalker, said in an interview regarding the latter film that we knew starting this that any decision we made, a design decision, a musical decision, a narrative decision, would please someone and infuriate someone else. And they're all right, and that's the important distinction to make. No film can please everyone, especially with the vastness of the Star Wars franchise. The regrettable part is that there is an MO of either it's exactly as I see it or you're my enemy. It's a crazy thing that is such a norm that seems to be void of nuance and compassion, and this is not a phenomenon about Star Wars, this is about everything. Weirdly enough, if anything, the sequels arguably lack an overt political gender at all compared to Lucas, beyond the apparent politics of diversity. While there is more diversity in the casting and elements that lead them to being classified as left-leaning, such as the rise of the First Order and the Ashes of the Empire definitely bearing parallels to the rise of the alt-right, it overall doesn't make anything near the same statements that Lucas once made. The sidelining of both John Boyega and Kevin Marie Tran throughout the trilogy shows that there's still a long way to go. Ironically enough, The Last Jedi actually had quite a lot to say about anti-capitalism, the democratisation of power, the Force, or rejecting a two-party system that breeds never-ending conflict, and so is perhaps the most in the mould of George Lucas. And of course, this was the film that was punished the most online for it. And it's fine not to like it, and it's fine to be disappointed if it doesn't match the Star Wars you thought it should be. As Abrams said, pleasing everyone is impossible, but is it fair to claim that this is somehow new, or not in keeping with the spirit of the franchise with everything we know about George Lucas? As Ryan Johnson said on Twitter on the matter, in response to claims that he had violated the spirit of Star Wars, 
For me, The Last Jedi 100% distills what the spirit and heart of Star Wars has been in my life. But yes, it is personal, it's a certain point of view, and it has to be. Originals are personal for George Lucas, that's why they're alive. Star Wars films will truly betray the heart and spirit of the originals if they lose that, and become soulless, clean homages. But being alive means being messy, and it means every film won't line up exactly with what every fan is expecting or wants. I'm sorry The Last Jedi didn't line up with your own certain point of view. Really, honestly I am. Star Wars has been caught inside an ideological divide, and it's overall a strange phenomenon to strike the franchise since it has always been demonstrably progressive from the beginning, even down to Princess Leia snatching a blaster and immediately taking charge of the boys' rescue attempt. The original films admittedly weren't perfect in this regard, considering for a start that there are only a handful of women and people of colour in the entire main cast but incorporating representation into the new movies shouldn't be considered a political agenda. Daisy Ridley and John Boyega aren't there to punish white people or take anything away from them. They're just there because they're the best actors for the job and because young girls and people of colour deserve role models that look like them as well. In the aftermath of Boyega's revelatory interview with GQ last year on how race and racism had defined his experience in Star Wars, he had this to say afterwards on Twitter. These conversations and me sharing isn't about a witch hunt. It's about clarity to an anger that can be seen as selfish, disruptive, and self-indulgent, obviously in hopes of better change. Somewhere along the line, somehow, diversity became a political matter, thanks in no small part due to rhetoric that encouraged people to feel targeted, and a culture that is drastically changing as a result of conversations that needed to be had, such as those surrounding Me Too or Black Lives Matter. Star Wars, though, has always been about a group of diverse individuals from different backgrounds standing up to the oppression of conformity, so there should be nothing wrong with making that group a bit more actually diverse. And besides, Star Wars without politics not only wouldn't be Star Wars, it wouldn't even be good science fiction, since the genre is the perfect breeding ground for such iconic explorations of political and social themes like Metropolis, Starship Troopers, Robocop, Star Trek, the list goes on and on. And just because the politics are there, doesn't mean you have to like or agree with them. Discourse isn't a bad thing. It and constructive discussion are arguably the point. Art always reflects its creator on some level, and Star Wars is definitely no different, especially looking at the life and work of George Lucas, who has always been a politically active and vocal filmmaker. Star Wars was put together in such a way as to not alienate audiences the way THX 1138 did, and to say more than American Graffiti, while still creating a fairy tale for all ages, but its politics are as integral to its DNA as Flash Gordon is. With that said, the films are still anyone's to interpret and discuss, because that's also the case with all art. It doesn't automatically make one person wrong or right. Just keep in mind that regardless of politics or agenda, the themes of all of Lucas's movies taught all of us not to give in to fear, hate or tyranny, and to embrace hope, inclusion and community. As he himself said, I would rather see us be a positive force in the universe than a cancer. We have the knowledge to be either one. That, in essence, is what Star Wars is about. We are both good and evil, and we have a choice. Thanks for watching. This was a little heavier than my usual content, but I hope you found it as interesting as I did in researching it. Please don't hesitate to like and subscribe. Every single one helps. And let me know what you think down below. Are the politics of Star Wars really already too much, or could Disney's era actually stand to lean harder into that side? Thanks again, and see you later.